Architectural building codes have saved cities over $132 billion from natural disasters. However, this has not always been the case. In our nation's history, we have lost many people because of building collapsing and other hazards and natural disasters, because we just didn't know enough about buildings back then. However, today, architects, engineers, and other building professionals are on this quest to build safer buildings than ever before. However, the code has become more complex, more ambiguous, more technical, almost a discipline in of itself than ever before. So for those of you who are new to the building code world or just need a refresher about what it's all about, in this video, we're gonna discuss the history, the overview and applications of the code and how it's organized and perhaps touch on whether codes have become any safer today than they were before. Humans have always been safety conscious as far back as the first human written code of laws called the Code of Hammurabi by King Hammurabi back in 1760 BC. What's interesting about the Code of Hammurabi is that it actually has no mention of construction methods or materials to use to build buildings. However, it does explicitly describe the consequences or penalties for buildings that were not properly constructed. Here's an example of what it states. If a builder builds a house for someone and does not construct it properly, and the house he built falls and kills its owner, then the builder shall be put to death. Biblical writings too had laws that govern the consequences of poor building design. All of this just emphasizes the obvious that we have a universal belief that life is precious and that it must be protected. No wonder that architects and engineers have such a great liability in their profession. The other side of the coin is actually having the knowledge of how to protect people. Unfortunately, the history of building codes has been a history of many deaths and learning the hard way. Building codes started emerging and getting updated in the early 1900s, after every major disaster in the US. For example, the Great Fire of 1871 destroyed downtown Chicago when a fire broke out one day in a barn and burned for 24 hours, destroying over 17,500 buildings over 73 miles of street. It also killed 300 people and left over 100,000 people homeless. Buildings at the time were constructed of a single layer of fireproofing and with a burning ember around and with combustible construction, buildings were not designed to withstand fires. After this fire, laws were passed requiring new buildings to be constructed with fireproof materials, such as brick and stone. Terracotta clay, also became an effective building material. One architect named John Van Ostel, at seeing his building nearly collapse, had buried blueprints in the basement covered with thick layers of sand and clay. Those blueprints survived the fire and illustrated that clay terracotta tile was a fireproof material. Hurricanes have also influenced building codes. After Category 5 Hurricane Andrew struck South Florida in 1992, sources report that there were over 65 fatalities and over $27 billion in damage. Before the hurricane hit, there were over 400 local building codes alone in the state of Florida. After the hurricane, Florida adopted the Florida Building Code, or the FBC which provides stringent wind-resistant construction, including shutters, impact-resistant windows, reinforced roofs, and hurricane straps for securing the roof to the walls. On the other side of the coast, earthquakes have also influenced building codes. After the 1994 Northridge earthquake in California, the code required reinforced concrete structures and seismic retrofitting for existing buildings, to name a few. It's definitely sad to look back at all the disasters as a whole, but 
I personally think we're in a much better place now. If you found this video useful, please give it a thumbs up and consider giving a super thanks of any amount. I'd really appreciate it. It helps the channel greatly. Thanks again, and let's continue. How does this impact who gets to regulate the building codes? From President George Washington to Thomas Jefferson, who encouraged the development of building codes, the 10th Amendment reserved power to regulate the safety of buildings to states. However, the Federal Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990, became a civil right governed by federal law. That is to say that this law prohibits discrimination on the basis of any disability, providing equal opportunity and equal access to both buildings and sites. States must abide by the federal ADA, but also by their own state accessibility guidelines if they've adopted their own. But aside from that, most building codes are regulated at the state and local level. Remember, at the state or local level, it is really the architect's job to ensure that their building complies with both the federal ADA and the state accessibility guidelines. However, the state building code officials will not be checking for federal ADA compliance. As far back as 1905, organizations across the U.S. started developing their own model codes. I won't bore you with all the names of those codes and organizations, but by 1994, all the different code organizations across the U.S. joined forces to form the national organization called the International Code Council, or ICC. The ICC was formally formed in 2003. It is the ICC who creates the current family of model codes or building codes that are used both in the US and globally today. We call it a family of codes because there are volumes of building codes from fire codes, electrical codes to mechanical codes and more. All building codes are related, but a building code is separated in each of its disciplines because it's so comprehensive. The entire family of model codes can be referred to as the International Building Code or the IBC. You'll hear this used a lot in the architecture, engineering and construction industry. This model code is developed and maintained by the ICC, an independent organization that is responsible for enacting the building code. This model code provides a level playing field for all states, avoiding redundancy across states and creates a common set of codes. More importantly, unlike the Code of Hammurabi, this code is focused on prescribing things like the allowed materials of the building or the construction size or how big a room can be and the number of people that can be in it. This code, in my opinion, has advanced much more than the code of our predecessors. The way these codes get adopted is at the state or local level. If the local jurisdiction decides to amend the state model code, then it must always be more stringent than the state code. If we go further down to the local level, then local cities and counties can adopt their own amendments to the model code to factor things like types of material available locally or labor organizations and rules, local building practices and local conditions and politics. Bottom line, whether you're at the federal, state, or local level, the goal is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. That is the bottom line of all building codes. It is the minimum requirements prescribed to be able to protect the health, safety, and welfare of all. It is nearly impossible and inefficient use of one's time to memorize the codes if you're in the AEC industry because A, it's thousands and thousands of pages long, and B, they get updated constantly because, as we know, our knowledge of buildings become greater and greater over time as we learn how disasters and other forces affect our buildings. The codes are enforced by various agencies, depending on the project type, 
and the specific code requirement. It really requires that you become well acquainted with those in your jurisdiction, checking your code sheets and making sure that you have all the pieces there. One big step building professionals can take is to do their due diligence and ensure that the code analysis is done thoroughly and not rely solely on building officials to either accept or reject their code analysis. Because again, the building code officials are not there to do a thorough analysis. They're making sure that all the major pieces are there, but everything else is really the building professional's responsibility. Again, the code is a minimum standard. It is the building professional's job to exceed that standard when they have the ability to. The model codes are updated every three years. For example, in California, the model codes are updated on a triennial code cycle every three years. The California code is always one year behind the international code. For example, IBC 2021 was adopted in California a year later in 2022. And since California has its own building code modeled after the international building code, it's called the CBC. The CBC is the California building code. It's essentially exactly the IBC or the international building code with amendments or with more, yes, you guessed it, more stringent requirements. I'd like to pose some follow-up review questions for you. You can list your answers in the comments below. What is the full name of the international family of codes used in the US today? Number two, the code is created to regulate what three areas? Remember, we mentioned three key areas that the code is designed to protect. And number three, who regulates the codes and how often?